What? I think we're live now, Mitch. I see live. It says live. Well, then... I, I don't know how to act if it's live, though. Okay, well, I'll, t I'll take the reins on this one. In five, <laughs> four, three, two, start the audio recording because I always forget to do that. One... <laughs> Hello and welcome back to a headache-inducing episode of DSLR Film New Podcast, where Hangouts just beats the tar out of Mitch and I. We've lost mic connections, we've uh, had all kinds of lag, and lately we've realized that uh, we are doing kung fu movies when we do the shows, because our mouths will move and then the words will come. It's really unfortunate that Hangouts is such a flaming pile of awesome. Mitch, what have you been up to since last week? Uh, I, maybe I should be trying to learn Japanese so it would really look right. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I know, I was, we were talking behind the, before the show started about, I looked at last week's show and the delay is just horrific. And, and the other thing I noticed is that if I put my hands on my desktop, because I have a standing desk, it shakes all over the place. And so I'll try not to do that today because I don't want to be shaky, Cam. <laughs> That's uh, a... That's actually why I moved the mixer back here is because every time I would hit a button, it would shake my entire desk. Yeah. And the dramatic uh, show starting music is not appropriate <laughs> shaking the entire desk. Uh, to answer your question, uh, excitement all over the place happened this past uh, week. Let's today, Friday, today's Friday, yesterday, Wednesday, we had a windstorm, rainstorm that blew through. And I was out front admiring the storm as it came. Uh, came inside as I started getting soaked, and lo and behold, a tree fell in the backyard. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's my tree. Did it go uh, through anything important, like your house? Uh, it went through my neighbor's car. Oh, crap. <laughs> so, we're having a lot of fun. I ended up chopping the whole thing down and cutting it up, and her yard had all sorts of stuff, you know. Now, is that an act of nature, or are you responsible for her car? Well, that's a large discussion going on right now between our insurance and their insurance. Um, and it turns out, uh, technically, uh, act of God, I don't know. And it's, and it's really kind of strange, because the way my insurance agent tells me, if the tree is dead, and it falls on your neighbor's yard or hurts their property then it falls under the liability aspects of your insurance policy, and they pay the claim. Yeah. But if it's a live tree, and it appears to be fine, as far as you can tell, you don't, you're not aware of any horrible illnesses or anything. Uh, if it falls, then the insurance company is like, eh, it's <laughs> not our problem. Uh, so now her in, in, in Missouri is a no-fault state, so uh. things – things are a little weird because it's, you know, it's, it's a tree that's on my property and it fell on her property, but her insurance is taking care of her car. But of course she has a deductible and she's like, well, you know, it was your tree. And my insurance agent says, well, yes, it was your tree, but you're not liable for her. Uh, you know, it was like if it was a city tree or I don't know if it was that's her even own more tree, difficult but, you know. because you live next to him. So Exactly. If the, if the results aren't uh, <laughs> adequate to both uh, parties, it could create a hostile living environment in the future. That's what that's what it really sort of comes down to is how how do you want to deal with your neighbor in the future? And so we'll probably end up helping her out somehow. But I don't know. First thing is to let the insurance companies duke it out and figure out what the what the right thing to do is, and then we'll move forward from there. But. It just, you know, you end up spending hours and hours and hours dealing with it, and it's just a mess. It's part of life, though, right? That's what happens. Things well, happen. Speaking of life, I've got uh, a little bit of update here. Look at this beautiful right. room. It's, uh, it's almost done. Uh, taking over some more space, adding about square feet of studio space to the basement here. Uh, couldn't do anything about the beams, though. Apparently, they are load-bearing beams and could not be moved without collapsing the house. So the construction continues here. I've had all my camera gear buried in safe spots so that the drywall dust does not penetrate every yeah. last orifice of my camera. Yeah. So 
Are you going to paint them or cover them up or anything? You could have lowered the roof and moved the wall in. Uh, actually, the because I'm tall, the beams are one <laughs> inch taller than where I would smack my head walking through nice. the room. So what we plan to do is they sell some very nice uh, wood laminate pieces that are, I mean, it's real wood, but it's very thin. And you can put it over to make it a little more decorative and beautiful looking than it currently is. <laughs> so that's the, the plan right now. We'll, we'll leave those exposed and then sort of rustic them up or something. Maybe add a, a barn door slider to the middle or something stupid like that. Are or, you I mean, mean, something interesting like that. I shouldn't, shouldn't denigrate yeah. barn doors. Yes. Are you going to use that as a studio or is it just going to be living? Uh, this one will be a hybrid. I'll probably use half of it for uh, lights and product shot stuff. And then the other half, um, I, I'm going to put in a couch for guests when they stay. We have another 1,200 square feet worth of basement to take over. So this is one of six sections of remodeling that's going wow. on. Uh, the, there is a dedicated uh, CNC room. Uh, that's going together right now that will have space for the laser, the uh, 2x4 CNC table, as well as 3D printers so everything can go back up and then uh, some vacuum forming stuff so I can get back into production of a few items that I used to sell. Uh, the other room will be strictly for photography. It'll have a green screen wall. Eric, strictly for video and photography, a green screen wall, all that business. And I'll be back to my old ways when I used to have a 2,000 square foot studio, which will be nice. Nice. Uh, so actually, I had no clue. See, I always learn something new about you. I mean, I knew that you had some parts that I thought you sold, but I didn't realize that you had your own CNC machine and, and all that other kind of gear to make parts. So... Yeah, I do a lot of rapid prototyping. Um, I used to have before... I had to downscale. I had an eight foot by four foot laser with a 200, I think it was a 220 watt uh, uh, CO2 cutting uh, cutting tube on it. So you could do a half inch and three quarter inch plywood. No problem. <laughs> well, okay, just imagine being able to cut an entire sheet of plywood at, with almost zero loss to your cuts because you're using a laser Nice. And you can basically just pick it up. They're smooth cut, ready to go. And it's awesome when you want to build your own custom furniture. No or, sawdust? No sawdust, just smoke. Nice. So you do have to ventilate the, the, the smoke out of the room, which isn't that big of a deal. I had a special outbuilding for that. But um, the really cool thing is, is I, I used to make these tables, these coffee tables, a line of coffee tables for people. And they're an interesting, intricate shape with three legs, and no one sells them there. You can't find them anymore, but it's a, a very similar design to an old, like, 40s table that was handmade back in the day. Yeah. And uh, so they, they did really well, and I miss that uh, extra income from those tables. Where, I want to know, where the hell do you find time to do – oh, wait, you don't have kids. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't watch TV. You do all kinds of crap. Yeah, yeah, TV is a suck, isn't it? Yeah, TV, if I watched a lot of TV, I would probably not have time to do many of the things that I do. It's, um, the only thing that is a problem for me is since I I like to move a little bit, I like to go around, change jobs, do different things, and so you get set up for a perfect thing, and you start doing it, and then you move, and it's like, you have to go out of production on something for a while. Yeah. Hopefully, I, w I yeah. want to get back into that. There's a few other cool wooden things that I want to build for cameras again. Uh, hint, maybe some grips of some kind. But uh, oh. I will, I'm not going to elaborate too far into that. <laughs> uh, before we get into the news, though, I wanted to mention one thing. I've got a number of emails asking where Devin's at. And I just want to let you guys know, Devin has not quit or anything like that. Unfortunately, right now, he is uh, serving a contract uh, for the president presidential elections and uh, because of that he Yikes. is uh, out in a hotel for the next month and a half wow and he is on call 100% of the time so it's just worked out that during show times when we were supposed to get together he has been on call shooting press releases and other such events at uh, the times of the show so nice uh, He's a really busy guy. He's, he's getting paid for his work, but uh, unfortunately, <laughs> that means he can't be on the show all the time. So 
Devin, we miss you. Keep up the good work out there, and good luck at the at the presidential. What, are we on the primaries? Is that what's going on? I, I'm not even paying any attention anymore. <laughs> uh, the Republican convention is next week in Cleveland, and oh, okay. that would explain why he's in Ohio. Yeah, yeah, they're they're talking about riots and all kinds of stuff going on. It should be interesting. Man, all right, this is not a news <laughs> podcast, so yes, I know. Right. I'm going to move on to the. News. news. Time for the news. Time for the news. Wait, I said this is not a news co- podcast, but it actually is a news <laughs> podcast. It's just not a podcast about political news. First thing on the agenda here is actually a lens. Uh, you know, this is kind of a weird one for me. Sony has been slowly but surely churning out more FE lenses as the popularity of their A7 line of cameras continues to grow. And this is yet another installation in that. This is the 50 millimeter F1.4 lens. This will set you back about $1,500. What? And it is in the same category for weather sealing and ultrasonic motors as the previously released 35 millimeter f14 which would also set you back about fifteen hundred dollars now mitch i put this in the show notes and i'm going to ask you this question i gave you a heads up ahead of time it doesn't fifteen hundred dollars seem a little steep when compared to some of the other even fe offerings that are on the table for the a7 line uh you showed it. For those of you who are watching live or watching the recording, uh, DJ did actually show the lens uh, from a press release image. And what's the big blue label on there? It says Zeiss. Okay, so now I love Zeiss. They're a sponsor of mine, and if my sound effects were working, I would hit the cash register. Uh, but Zeiss is known for really high-quality lenses that are, what, pricey. And so if this is a combination of Sony and Zeiss working together on something, it ain't going to be cheap. And as my father used to say, get what you pay for. Now, that being said, we all know that there's a fine line between ultimate gorgeous lenses and lenses that get the job done. And the biggest question you kind of have to ask yourself is, Will my viewers care? Does do the people that are watching the video or the stills that you're going to shoot with this, is it really going to matter that much to them whether you got a fifteen hundred dollar lens or a nine hundred dollar lens? It's up to you. You got to make that decision. But looks like a gorgeous lens. I'd I'd be interested in trying this sucker out. Well, one of the things uh, that kind of surprised me is uh, these FE lenses, as they announced, even the ones that say Zeiss on them, like the uh, 55mm F1.8, which I personally own, uh, the the prices fall off pretty fast. Here's the used market for the Sony 55mm F1.8. And for those of you uh, listening, I'm actually showing Amazon's used page on this right now. You can pick up a 55mm F1.8 for about $680, which is you know, basically half of the cost of the 50 millimeter f1.4 so and that's down from i believe the original retail price of that was around 1200 bucks do you think we're gonna see that fall off and do you think that fall off might be part of uh an issue that the lenses are not adaptable to any other type of camera body well yeah yeah i i think that's a very valid point uh and in terms of most of the stuff that we've ever talked about on this podcast, lenses are realistically an investment, right? And we say that um, quite often. And if you if if things are really happening, like like you're saying in this example of fall off in terms of a fifty percent loss of value, um, if you compare that, for example, to the Canon lenses that are the famous ones, and I don't know what the pricing on the 50 millimeter is, but like the 70 to 200 that I have, are you going to throw in a price? Oh, yeah, the 51 2, you can still get about $1,200 out of it on the used market, and uh, it can, it's consistent. It's, its price has pretty much maintained that consistent level for the last, I don't know, seven or eight years. And I, th- I think you, what I'm trying to say is I think you've got a very valid point in that. The, the Canon lenses, because of their usability on multiple 
camera mounts, formats, uh, bodies is what I'm trying to say, maybe they retain more of their value partially because of that and partially because of the Canon name and everything else that goes into it. But like the 70 to 200 IS, those, those prices are staying up pretty well. The one that I bought, the 135 that I bought a couple of weeks ago, months ago, whatever that was, uh, you know, list price is like a thousand dollars, and I think I paid seven hundred for it. So, you know, it's it's not dropping down to fifty percent, but it's it's relatively up there. And I think that's another good point that you constantly bring up is to remind us that there's a used market out there. And if you buy a lens that's a uh, you know high quality lens that's on the used market, the price realistically isn't going to depreciate as much theoretically as if you paid retail for it new out of the box so maybe that is a concept people ought to really pay more attention to is is the used market well the reason i bring the uh the price drops up is i'm i was thinking about uh old lenses earlier today and i was thinking about nikon specifically remember the nikon nikor line of of manual focus lenses at one point in the early 2000s you couldn't give those lenses away. People did not want them. Like you, you I picked up an entire set of those uh, and maybe spent a hundred and fifty dollars, and that was a bunch of uh, good primes all across the board. Now, each one of those old primes that were basically junk back then to people are now fetching, you know, five hundred and ninety-nine to six hundred or even more, depending on which prime you own. And I look at these, and I, and I think, well, why are the Nikon lenses, those old lenses, worth so much? Well, because they can go on pretty much anything. You can adapt them to Canon. You can adapt them to uh, Sony. You can adapt them to your GH4. And Canon is sort of in the same boat. But with this mirrorless market that's coming out, you're sort of locked in with your lenses. You yeah. can't adapt them to anything because the lens flange distance is so long that there's no way to put any kind of intermediary in there to a Canon body without disassembling an entire chunk of the lens. Uh, you think that's going to hurt Sony moving forward if another competitor moves in with uh, better technology in their bodies? Canon? Uh, some hint <laughs> about a Canon mirrorless uh, maybe coming along? Oh, that's a uh, great transition. <laughs> <laughs> um it's it's certainly something to think about uh, depending upon what your professional level is um, and and by the way the the Zeiss the, the Sony that we started out the Zeiss if it's if it's got waterproofing and that kind of stuff that maybe some of the other lenses aren't as Don't good have. at that's something else you ought to consider uh, but let's not forget that we've reported on problems with Sony repair and quality levels uh, and you know taking months to get your camera or your lenses re repaired and, and get them back there are there's more than just the price of the frickin body uh, or the lens that comes into play if you're going to use these pieces of equipment long term professionally absolutely as a Canon, what, what do they call it now? The CP, the Canon Certified Professional CCP. Uh, you pay them 100 bucks, and you're part of their like uh, cleaning your lens program. Uh, I've always been happy with that and taking my lenses in to get them cleaned up and my camera bodies in. So That's CPS, by the way. CPS, thank you. Canon, Canon Professional Services. There we go. All right. Speaking of Canon, let's go ahead and hit that story while we're on the subject. Uh, there's been a lot of rumors about Canon's new timeline for lens releases as well as the highly anticipated 5D Mark IV. Woo! That body has been showing up in the news, especially on uh, planet5d.com as well as uh, Canon rumors and various other places. Uh, Mitch, We've got a little specs rundown here. What do you think about this? Uh, this seems like they're sort of starting to solidify. Are we going to see a 28 megapixel Canon 5D Mark IV? Um, I've been targeting a couple of my sources, and they're not giving me anything. Uh, Craig over at Canon Rumors has has a lot more sources than I do, uh, and and I hadn't really thought about it, uh, but. It's coming up pretty fast. Yeah, <laughs> it's we're the middle of July already. 
We're really close to October, which is the anticipated release time. Yeah, uh, and Craig's talking about an August, potentially August announcement. Of, well, guess what? That's a month away. We yep. might be really excited in a month. I don't know. Uh, the specs are interesting, 28 megapixel. I don't know about that because they made a lot to do about the current 5D Mark III, the 23 whatever megapixel uh, being the right size for video. And so I don't know about bumping up to 28, whether or not that impacts it, but I'm sure they've thought of that. Uh, rumors do say 4K finally. You know, you and I were talking for a long time about the 5D Mark IV not having 5D, right? Uh, I guess, names. Uh, Possibly not having uh, 4K. Yeah, but you, but you also have to realize that it's, we're now on four years that the 5D Mark III has been out. And the original Canon cycle time for the 5Ds, and, and typically most of their professional cameras, has been about three years. So we're kind of a year late. And, and so finally, they finally, I think, have realized that 4K is a must, right? If, if they didn't have 4K on this now, <clears throat> they would literally be laughed out of the market. And it's not that hard. They know 4K. Now's the time to do that. Uh, the price, according to Craig, is a little bit higher than even the list price. I, if I recall, it wasn't. It was 3300 or was it 34 I I, don't, I think I paid 30, uh, 3400 for mine yeah. originally. So Craig's talking about a list price of 36 which is, you know, inflation and 3600 and yen and all that other, you know, valuation. The thing that is really curious is most curious to me is the touchscreen. Craig mentions a touchscreen, and I haven't gone back and asked him about this, but I'm, I'm just dying to know this. And and I've tried to, like I said, tried to contact a couple of people that I think might have had their hands on one, uh, because. If this is a touch screen like the 1DX Mark II, where it's only available shooting video, and that's for establishing the focus points and doesn't go through all the menus and give you all the other wonderful features, I'm going to be really, really pissed. Uh, because why put a touch screen on there if it doesn't do everything? Yeah, that's a, that's sort of true. And when you do a touch screen, I, I also sort of jones for the flip out screen. Like oh, if yeah. I, if I, you know, you have a touchscreen, you want it to be in a position that makes the touchscreen useful. And if it's simply flat all the time, uh, you're going to have to tilt your camera forward to dink around with the touchscreen and then tilt it back to use it in this normal manner, which is quite frustrating. Two of the specs that caught me uh, by surprise on this list here are actually, uh, number one, the frames per second in photo mode. Uh, this is the first 5D Mark IV uh, information that I've seen where they are giving pretty high high shutter speeds, which, I mean, nine frames per second, that's fairly substantial compared to the four and, what, maybe four and a half of the 5D Mark III. That's getting into a previous generation of 1D series action there, which is really nice. Uh, the other one that I was actually, I'm kind of hoping that it's true, is the CFast and SD card slot. Uh, and I know that sounds like a, a weird thing to be excited about, but as a person who has buckets of freaking 128 gig, and I'm holding one up right now, 128 <laughs> gig memory card just laying around my desk. I've got like six of them here. I would like to continue to use these for as long as they are viable. But I would also like a path forward if I need to in order to go to a faster media. Uh, to me, especially for stills, like there's nothing wrong with a SD card. And I would like to continue to utilize my investment in so many freaking memory cards that I have <laughs> in my collection. Uh, other than that, you know, most of this stuff sort of seems like what I would hope or expect Canon to do. Now, do you think the 4K addition to the 5D Mark IV might represent the extra year of lag time in the cycling of the 5D line? I don't think that's the only thing, but uh, I think that's probably where they, they probably think that this is the right time to put that in the market. 
I think it's a market timing issue. They know how to do 4, 4K. They've no, known for a long time how to do 4K. Um, and, you know, we're going to get back to the question of is it going to be motion JPEG or something else? Uh, ugh. Ugh. But, oh, by the way, I get to correct you on something. Uh-oh, I, what I do? I love it when I actually know something, and I just confirmed it. It's The 5D Mark III is six frames per second. Oh, is it okay? I was thinking um, like five or four and a half, it's, but it's hard to remember all these things, DJ. It's just really hard, and I screw things up all the time. So I'm not ripping on you. I just wanted to make sure that that we all know that it's six frames per second. So nine would be definitely an increase. It's well, nowhere the... close to the 14 frames on the 1DX Mark II. But what was the original uh, 7D? Wasn't that eight frames per second or nine frames per second? That I don't remember. So it I can tell faster. you yeah. that it was... I can't tell you the frame rate because my obviously I'm slipping here on the frame <laughs> rates, but what I can tell you is that the speed of the seven, original 70 in burst mode was excellent, in my opinion. And it, was the, it was about the perfect speed for me. Maybe you could go a little bit faster, but it was really enjoyable if you're shooting like sports or, or something like that. And now, you know, with the, if this has that frame rate or a higher frame rate, uh, that's, that's great. I mean, for sports photographers, especially. And the question then becomes, where does that leave the 70? Are they going to uh, create a, you know, another 70 Mark three that has even higher frame rates? And I know the 70 Mark two did have a jump in frame rates as well. So, I uh, try and keep all those numbers in my head. I'm, I'm wondering, like, <laughs> which one do you get if you're the sports photographer? Is 9 fast enough, or do you need, like, 10? Is 11 fast enough? How many frames per second do you think you need, Mitch? Uh, I don't need anything faster than 5, because I don't shoot that fast at any time. Because I don't, I don't, frankly, I don't want to sit there and go through a whole bunch of them. Now, I, re I remember having a conversation with somebody not too long ago about uh, he shoots his daughter's softball games, and he wants to have the, the actual, just after the ball, her, his daughter's a pitcher, after the ball has been released, you know, just like an inch or two off of her fingertips. And that's hard to capture, and therefore doing a high bursts would allow you to get that. But then you've got all those other frames that you end up having to throw away. Uh, the 7D is rated at 7 frames per second. Uh, there's some talk about 8 frames per second in high speeds, but that's a, probably a buffer issue. But just that's a real, I'm giving you the answer to the question. So the, the 5D Mark III is 6. The 7D is rated at 7 frames per second. Um, and, and I, anyway, and the 1DX Mark II is 14 frames a second. So that's a, significant leap but of course that's six thousand dollar camera um and and it actually goes up to 16 frames a second if you're in live view yes you lock the shutter and right. then you're good to go right so if you need that if you need that you you gotta pay for it right uh, I looked up the five or the seventy Mark II while we were talking, and it's uh, that one is ten frames per second. So it's, it? it would be slight, like a, a slight lead over the five uh, D Mark IV if this number is actually correct. Right. Uh, one of the things I usually run into is um, uh, if I if I go out in the forest, you'll see wildlife photographers, and they generally do the burst mode yes. one, and they also uh, really love the 7D because of the crop sensor. So right. now they can slap their big lens on there and get that extra bit of reach out of their camera and yep. uh, still get all the megapixel uh, count so that they can zoom in, crop, or whatever. Uh, also, if you go to any sporting events, those are great places for high shutter speeds. I'm personally, as a lazy photographer, if I'm getting paid to, occasionally, I don't do it very often because I hate weddings, but occasionally <laughs> I get sucked into doing a wedding because the price is right. And in those circumstances, as a lazy photographer, I use burst mode exclusively throughout the entire wedding because it's just so freaking convenient. Like yep. you, you see a little kid dancing and doing something cute, 
you just hold down the trigger and uh, you know <laughs> one of those shots is gonna turn out and it, it's not the right way to be a photographer but uh, sometimes you can't make your subject stay still all you can do is frame around them and wait for the moment to appear in one of your shots so yes and and I I can tell you going to my daughter's dance recitals where they were allowing cameras and some parents were just doing burst and pray kind of stuff and I was like this is not the right. I'm better than that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Actually, one really cool thing about that, if you guys use uh, uh, Google Photos, and you should check this out if you haven't, if you do shoot burst mode, as soon as Google Photos detects a burst of photos, it'll actually generate a little uh, animation uh, with the photos for you nice. and, and give it to you in a really easy to, to uh, use and ingest package. And... I found when I go occasionally when I'm selling uh, my films at uh, conventions, I'll take a break and usually they'll have some sort of event. Uh, at one place they were doing cosplay chess, which is where you know cosplay characters dress up like chess pieces and they attack uh -huh. each other. Yeah. And uh, so I put it into burst mode when they were attacking each other, and you end up with these really funny, sort of hilarious motion JPEGs of you know two kids dressed up like anime characters, like <laughs> fighting or you know shooting stuff at each other or you know stabbing each other, stuff like that. It's it's pretty enjoyable. I don't know what the practical outcome of that is other than a giggle at the end of the day when I see it right. pop up on my phone, but uh, right. very fun to look at. Now, speaking of fun to look at and fun to use, we've bashed on action cams left and right for a while, and what do I do? I go out and buy another <laughs> freaking action cam because that's what I need in my collection is yet another action cam, and I have it right here. This is the... Yi, and I've been pronouncing this incorrectly, and people have, uh, thanks for all your input. Uh, it's not <laughs> the YI, it is the Yi Action Cam. This is the 4K variant, and I've got it right here with the Hero 4 Black Edition. Uh, these two cameras, basically the same size. Uh, the Y, or the Yi, is slightly longer, uh, but otherwise very, very similar in size, shape, and dimension. But this thing offers a lot of value at 249 you get in-camera image stabilization which uh, isn't the case with the hero what? 4 black edition really? yeah the, yeah and it's really good actually um, just shooting with the camera holding it like this and I'll be posting some videos of that shortly but uh, it is amazing how well the three axis image stabilization in this works in camera you can only shoot 1080p because they're using uh, motion around the right. sensor space in order to accomplish that but dang is it good and you can do that at 60 frames per second too so if you have a lot of action going on and you want to you know slow something down you can easily accomplish that uh, the touch screen is extremely responsive and look at this boot time you hold the button down and the camera's on nice. that's it Everybody who's, who's ever used a GoPro has experienced that lag of like, oh, I want to shoot something, and then you wait four seconds or five seconds for the freaking camera to boot up, and you miss whatever it was that you're booting your camera up for. The other thing that's amazing about this, and, you know, I'm jumping up and down because it's 249, but you can log into this via your phone uh, via a 5 gig connection as opposed to a 2.4 gig connection. And at first I thought that was sort of gimmicky. I'm like, ah. You know, what's this going to do for you? But you know what it does? No. Almost no lag nice. in video. So if you've ever used the GoPro app, another painful experience. Logging in, sometimes it doesn't want to log into your phone. Sometimes you can't get into it. And then when you do, you know, you can turn the camera here and wait to a count of three Mississippi, and then suddenly you'll see it on your phone. With this guy in its 5G mode logged into my Samsung Galaxy S7, it's almost instantaneous. You can follow the screen on the back of this and the screen on your phone and see everything nice. happen at the same time. I I'm really quite impressed with this. And the Wi-Fi login is also a breeze. It was, it was one of the simplest connection uh, propositions I've run into with any of the Wi-Fi controls on any of the cameras that I own. So uh, kudos to you guys for doing a really great job on this camera. Uh, now, there are some downsides. It's not what? perfect. What? One of the glaring uh, omissions to the design of this is if you're familiar with the Hero 4 Black Edition, there's a USB to 3.5 millimeter audio adapter that can be used with the camera so that you can use lav mics or even professional audio if you really want to get crazy with this guy. 
Uh, the other thing that's missing is Wi-Fi, or excuse me, not Wi-Fi, uh, HDMI output. So if you want to, and I actually know people that do this, record the output via HDMI of their GoPro to an external uh, capture device in order to get better video. Nice. Which, you know, I'm not sure what the logistics are of that, but there's probably an application that I don't know about that that would make a lot of sense, or even as a high high end webcam. So, I don't know, Mitch. Now that I've told you the pluses and the minuses between these two cameras, are you going to go out and spend 249 on a little cute, adorable action cam? You know the answer to that. It's no, no. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't have a need for one, but. Uh, you what you just highlighted is the fact that this will now have a pro version coming out in a few months <laughs> that will have the adapters that you're after that will cost another 50 bucks and then you'll be really happy <laughs> um, I do note though I'm curious in the specs on Amazon it says stable 4k video but you're implying that if you put the stabilization on there it drops down to 1080 so I'm on version of the firmware 1.09 right now, and it started with 1.07, so features have been added each time. Wow. And at current, and it's been updated twice in the last... You just uh, got it. <laughs> yeah, it's been twice in the last four days, and features have already shown up on this, which is, is pretty impressive. Uh, but uh, as far as I know right now, and I'm double-checking the menus, in advanced mode, uh, if you set your video to 4K, you get a grayed out view of your image stabilization. And I'm uh -huh. double checking that now, but it does appear that you cannot select image stabilization while you are in 4K mode. Amazon lies. So that, yeah, and here, for those of you watching, I mean, I'm looking at it right now, it says electronic image stabilization and it is definitely grayed out. It only allows you to turn it on at 1080p. So. Maybe that's uh, something in the future. I don't see how they could do that, though, because this has a very similar sensor size to the Hero 4 Black Edition, which uh, means that you know, you're know you basically utilizing corner to corner in ultra mode. Uh, it's also not quite as wide as the Hero 4 Black Edition. I think uh, the angle of view might be 155 versus 100 and. 62-ish. Uh, don't quote me on either one of those numbers, uh, yeah. but they're slightly different from each other. So, uh, really interesting offering. Um, I'm actually pretty excited about it, and the battery life is, it's great. It's How's great, guys. the battery life? Uh, about, you know, normally, have you ever seen those those uh, uh, Apple announcements, like, this will last you 12 yeah. hours, you know, talk all day, no problem. And then uh -huh. you get it, and it's like legitimately, it's more like eight and a half to nine hours, and you, you know, they're scaling back. With this, that's not the case. The number they give you is pretty close to accurate. They say two hours. I went, I want to say an hour and like 54 minutes before the battery went dead on me. Nice. And that's very impressive compared to a, a Hero 4 Black Edition. Now, uh, the price is misleading, and I say that because at 249, and Minch mentioned this earlier, you don't get any of the accessories that you get with a Hero 4 Black Edition, which is in your case, your remote control, uh, your little tether thing, and some other clip on adapters. All you get is the camera and a USB cable and a battery, and that's it. So, but, oh, but what? But what did what did you highlight in your video that it also has on the uh, bottom? Oh, it does have a quote that Mitch is, uh, is doing this uh, for me here. It's, uh, it does have a quarter 20 on Yay! the bottom, which means you can, right out of the box, put it on a little tripod like this guy right here and not have any issue. You don't have to have the frickin' case and, and their little adapters and everything else. Absolutely. To be able to mount it somewhere. So, but, that's, so you say it's a negative because it doesn't have them, but... But they have sort of compensated for it. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and that's what I'd rather have anyway most of the time is a freaking quarter 20. Yeah, and that's true. And there's a lot of arguments to uh, the case actually reducing image quality on these smaller cameras. I know a lot of people that prefer to shoot with the Hero 4 Black Edition naked uh, with no cover over the lens because they feel that it looks better. And to be honest, if you have a cheap plastic camera, uh, cover over the front of your lens, it's definitely not going to improve your image quality. Right. Um, for me, the case is more for extended time lapse. So if I'm shooting something where I can't monitor the camera and it could possibly rain, I don't want to burn up a, 
a nice little camera because I was too lazy to put it in a case uh, or dropping it in the water, of course, you know. Right. And at that point, if you're shooting in the water, does a small amount of image quality loss through no. plastic really make that much of a difference? No. I, I would argue no. Right. But uh, you can fight me on that one if you want to. No, I'm not going to fight you. I, I was kind of impressed to the side-by-side -side you did in your video. It, it looks a little bit like the colors and the brightness are enhanced on the Yi as opposed to the Black Edition, but I'm sure you can deal with that in post-production, but what's your, what's your gut feel on the, on the looking of the, the video itself? I would say to me that the Hero 4 Black Edition has a little more contrast in the image than the Yi. Uh, but that's just uh, anecdotal from looking at different shots. Uh, we don't have a Pro Tunes, a Pro Tune version of shooting modes for the Yi uh, compared to the GoPro Hero sure. 4 Black Edition. So uh, some of the color analysis that you can do and some of the uh, color correction that you could do with that flatter image style is, is going to be lost to you. Now, I would argue that probably 70% of the people that own a GoPro are just simply wanting their image to come straight out of the camera and right. go to whatever media platform they're addressing. So for many users, that's completely fine. Uh, it is a little bit, uh, what would be the term, dolled up uh, as far as coming out of the camera. So uh, be prepared to have a little bit of uh, pre-added saturation and so on. Now, they could update the firmware yet again and add maybe a flat mode or a less, uh, less contrasty mode that would maybe give you more of a flat style image. And I'll continue testing with this too because that's only one scenario. Uh, shooting with a, a bright sky like that does tend to sort of wash out the image a little bit. So it's, a, it's not the perfect example, but when you and only have 10 minutes at the end of the day, <laughs> that's what you shoot. Have you done any low light testing yet? Have you seen any? I have. Uh, it, it gets noisy. It okay. does. Um, it's it's the same issue you run into with the Hero 4 Black Edition in indoor lighting settings. Or what I would say like a living room uh, with no exterior light coming in, you are going to get a little bit of grainy noise in your image. Uh, Shocking. Which, no, it's, I mean, that's, <laughs> it's not, right. that's not bad at all. That's, ex no. that, that's like 1600 ISO. Uh, smacking up against the limit of what I set up for these, this particular camera, which is 1600. And it's the same thing that I set as a limit for my Hero 4 Black Edition. And I would say the noise in both cameras is fairly comparable. Uh, th that's about as good as you can really expect in low light for a freaking tiny cell phone size sensor here. Yep. It's, it's really good, actually. Um, if you do want to go any further than that and you are planning to shoot indoors or in dark areas, uh, I would recommend one of those cube lights. Uh, they're waterproof. They have their own internal battery. They're powered via, or you can charge them via USB. And they put out, I think, two or 300 lumens. And uh, you can attach them to the top, and they're smaller than a Hero 4 or, a, you know, this uh, Yi action cam. And it, it provides light forward, which is usually what you're trying to illuminate anyhow. Uh, they're really handy, and they're uh, wireless controlled, so you can dim them in groups or brighten them in groups if you're trying to light something a little bit more uh, complicated. Cool. All right. So th All right. <laughs> that just dropped, fell right off a cliff here. Let's... Uh, <laughs> Let's move on to uh, what else we got here, Mitch. Oh, ah, okay, we got two more things in the lineup. Uh, I just threw this in here really quick because um, uh, recently, you know, there's been a lot of stuff in the press about uh, uh, the police and uh, uh, photographers and video being taken. And I don't want to get political or, uh, you know, make what? anybody angry. But what I do want to mention is make sure, guys, that you know your rights because as a photographer taking photos of things in plain visible view of the public in public spaces is a right. Uh, you are allowed to do that. You, that means if you are at a train station, if you are near a Capitol building or anything like that, uh, police cannot come at you and tell you to delete photos uh, simply for taking them in public. Uh, be cautious, uh, be courteous, and don't instigate anything. I do not want anybody hurt for arguing with uh, any 
uh, of public officials. But uh, also, they do sell cards that are very, very affordable. I think they're 20 cents, and the ACLU, as well as many other organizations, offer them up, and you can keep them in your wallet so that if someone does get aggressive with you, you can simply hand them the card, and it explains explicitly your rights as a photographer to them so that everybody is on the same page. Mitch, well, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I have a couple of things. Um, interestingly enough, and, and I, I don't think it's a political issue, if if you do some research, and I don't have the links in front of me right now, but it, I found it interesting that we have a lot of rights that we don't necessarily know about. Uh, and in terms of if a policeman approaches you, uh, basically, if they don't have a right to detain you, if they don't suspect you of a crime, then you can leave. And a lot of times, you know, I will stand there if a policeman approaches me and I will talk to him like crazy and answer all of his questions and give him my ID and all that other kind of stuff. And if you do your research, you don't actually have to do any of that if you don't want to. If they're yeah. not accusing you of a crime or detaining you for suspic suspicion of a crime, if you say, am I being detained? And they say no, then you say, okay, I can leave. And they cannot detain you. Now, if they turn around and say, I suspect you're doing X, Y, and Z, then that's a whole other matter. But so do some, do some research there because, you know, the, the other thing, what, you know, if you comply with the policeman and don't argue and don't fight with them, you're in a lot more, you're a lot, you're not going to get shot, okay? I'll just say that. All right. Now, the other thing that was interesting, have you seen the video of the guy who attacked a photographer with his truck? No. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. You got to see. This is insane. And I didn't watch the whole thing. But the so, so there's a, a crew that's recording a car. They're doing like a video of a... Uh, like a car commercial, right? I, there's mm -hmm. just a couple of guys and they're learning how to shoot or whatever. So they're, they're on a two lane road out in the country. And this guy comes up in his truck and starts telling the young people that it's his driveway and that they're on private property and they need to leave. And they say, I'm sorry, but this is a labeled state road. You know, it's it's got a name and it's not your driveway. And he gets real belligerent about it and starts charging them with his truck. He's physically driving Whoa. right up to them and then slamming on his brakes, yelling and screaming cuss words and all this other stuff about get off my property. This is my property, blah, blah, blah. Thankfully, they recorded it and turned around. <laughs> The police have arrested the guy and put him in jail for assault because yeah. he was using a 5,000-pound vehicle to threaten somebody, which obviously you don't want this guy to run you over, and you obviously have rights. But here's another situation where this gentleman was you know, thinking that photography is bad, they must be criminals. Uh, I don't know that handing him a little card that says here are my rights <laughs> would have done any good <laughs> in this situation i think you know somebody starts threatening you you just kind of pack up and go away uh and and obviously in this case since they had the video evidence this guy's screwed i mean <laughs> he, in my opinion he, he seems like he's in trouble uh in a younger uh, dj way back in the day uh i was i was filming something uh, and there, there happened to be a protest going on across the street that I wasn't part of or aware of. Uh, but uh, the officers thought that we were taking pictures and filming them. And they came to me personally and told me that I had to delete everything. And when I, I refused to comply, I got uh, charged with nonviolently resisting arrest and wow. a failure to comply with an officer. Uh, both charges were thrown out. Uh, but I was uh, detained for the maximum 24 hours. Wow. And uh, uh, d definitely roughed up a bit. 
Uh, so, and that was in Florida, in my home state in Nebraska. That they're really great people. I, I don't. I'm not saying Florida's a bad oh, people. Oh no. Uh oh. I'm just, just saying uh -oh. that the, you know it was. It was during um, uh, spring break, so I'm guessing maybe they, they were a little on edge, and it was my own fault, too, for uh, not knowing my own right. I mean, I knew my rights, but uh, not better expressing or somehow managing to defuse the situation. And, you know, if it gets tense like that, unfortunately, there are things that they can knock you over the head with. And, uh, you know, nonviolently resisting arrest... Uh, that's a very broad term that right. Uh, right. <laughs> puts you into some situations. So yeah. uh, just be real cautious, as Mitch said, and, and don't try to provoke any anybody. Uh, the card obviously doesn't work for everybody, but sometimes uh, changing the lanes of the conversation from yelling at each other to, here, could you read this for me? Yeah. Uh, throws yeah. people so off of their game that uh, they stop for a second and reassess the situation instead of trying to attack you with a 5,000 pound truck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's bad. Okay. All right, last thing on the list here before we get out of here, because that, that went a little longer than I was expecting, is a <laughs> lens release. Are you shocked with me? Really, DJ? You're no, really I'm not shocked. shocked. <laughs> it, was a, it was a really good discussion. And actually, you know, everybody, there's a link in the show notes to the uh, ACLU page on photography. Uh, scrum through that if you haven't read it. It's, it's a really helpful little guide that just tells you what you can and can't do. And keep that in the back of your head when you go shoot in the public domain because you don't want to get batoned or tasered. Oh. And I, I've had pepper spray in my eyes before. It is a very very unpleasant experience you do not want to no. get involved with that situation now a situation you might want to get involved with yes let's is go the sam young blockbuster this is sort of a strange uh method that they're using to announce lenses uh every monday they're going to announce a new lens for the next uh, five weeks that's starting Here. monday the 18th sam young plans to announce five lenses each of these will be a buster so to speak and it's interesting because they have basically led with this sort of teaser image showing five lenses in, in sort of a uh, Captain Planet style uh, set of designs with you know earth sky city water you know all the way around it's it's a it's a different approach uh, but interestingly Mitch and I wanted to bring this up for two reasons one uh, in May we heard information that Sam Young would be announcing or would be releasing lenses that had autofocus for the first time and the autofocus specifically was targeted towards uh, Sony FE bodies. Now a couple of these lenses here look very similar to the mock-ups of the lenses that we saw for their AF lenses uh, uh -huh. for the Sony bodies. Now, I may be just spoiling their blockbuster announcement <laughs> of their previous announcement, but do you think they're simply going to announce a couple of the lenses that we've already sort of heard about and finally actually get those onto the market? Getting them on the market would be significant. Um, actually, this is, this is the first I've heard of this, so I appreciate you bringing this to my attention because I've not been – I mean – you know, there are so many different lens manufacturers, and bless your heart, you know everything there is to know about every lens that's ever been produced. Uh, but I've never really investigated Sam Yang, and I didn't realize that they were autofocus only. I mean, manual focus only, which would have turned me off in the first place, which is probably why I never bothered, because, you know, I'm lazy, I won't like autofocus. Uh, um, Sam Yang was well known for buying up... Uh generations of, of Russian lenses right and uh, various other uh, Chinese and Japanese designs and putting those into modern bodies uh, their their early starts were a 85 millimeter f14 that was released under uh, both the uh, Rokinon borrower and Sam Young wow. brands you know and, some stuff and those three brand branded lenses were pretty popular for uh, people who who wanted to have shallow depth of field but could not afford to pay for a very expensive lens. Now it looks like they're shifting that technology into AF, but this is their first uh, foray into that. Uh, previously, as we mentioned earlier, Sony partners with Zeiss, but uh, I would guess in this case 
there is no official partnership. Uh, these guys are probably doing similar to uh, uh, some of the other manufacturers that uh, reverse engineer the yeah. controls and then try to come up with something. Now, in that regard, we have seen some really good lenses from Sigma and Tamron and some of the other, uh, Tokina is another great example, and, and they've really got it down. But uh, this company is moving into it for the first time. Mitch, you've been around a lot longer than me, <laughs> and you probably had some experience with the very first generation of these off-brand lenses with autofocus. How were they at the beginning? Do you know? Do you? I mean, can you comment on no, uh, how bad they were back in the day? No, I I can't. And, and I, I I the only experience I had early on, besides having Canon lenses, was that I bought Tamron, and that was back in the day where they had what they called the Adapt All adapter. So you would buy a different adapter that would put that lens onto Canon or Nikon or whatever. And uh, I always kind of disliked it because it was, I mean, it was like an inch thick. It wasn't really secure. I didn't feel like it always held my lenses very well. And so I've never purchased any of these these lenses whatsoever. Um, but... You know, Tamron's much better now. So let me ask you a question, which okay. I hadn't really ever thought about before, but maybe you know the answer. The implication to me is that there's a, a – is there a licensing fee that Samyang or others would have to pay to Canon, for example, to be able to do the autofocus – stuff you said reverse engineering it just kind of implies to me that maybe they were trying to stay cheap by not wanting to pay for some licensing issue now i can tell you that i have no idea if canon has a a shop in their you know big canon headquarters where you walk in and say hey i want a canon license uh to make lenses what i can tell you is that both samyung all right excuse me not samyung uh both sigma and tokina and tamaron all of those companies, uh, they design their own controls from scratch. And okay. the reason you know that there's issues is because when Canon releases a body that no longer complies with the same lens standards as previous generations, they'll end up issuing firmware updates or or, lens, or other things will happen. And because of that, uh, Sigma, for example, built and sells a USB adapter that allows you to simply update the firmware on your lenses Makes and sense. do other uh, updates when Canon releases a body that, for some reason or another, has issues in certain modes with the lens. And we saw that actually with the uh, 1D Mark, or the 1D X Mark II. I think I'm getting that right, where they actually issued a firmware update for several Sigma lenses in order to get them to work properly with that particular body. Uh, could they license it from Canon? I don't know. Honestly, yeah. I have no yeah. idea if Canon would actually provide that. Uh, it seems like because no one's ever uh, done that and they've always kind of figured it out that it's sort of perpetuated a market where that's the case. I mean, look at Metabones, for example. Uh, right. They come up with all their own controls and so on, uh, and various other. Photo Deox has several adapters. Uh, there are a number of companies that are making uh, Aperture. For do you remember the ACR from Aperture? Yes. The, I mean, that's the same story. You know, they're right. figuring out how the signal comes in and then convert it to a signal to go out. So. Yeah, I, okay. I don't know if why they do it that way. If they could have licensed it, that would have been great. But maybe Canon wanted to like lock down and make sure that their lenses had a little bit better, uh, <laughs> you know, head start over any competition, right. so that no one could just move into their sector. Right, makes sense. Thanks. See, I yep. know you know some stuff. Now, the reason I asked about the history and the older lenses was because at one uh, uh, Tamron manufactured a lens that was called the uh, it was the 28 to 75 millimeter f2.8, and it was one of their earlier zooms, not their earliest, but I believe it. They started manufacturing it in like the late 90s, maybe early 2001, 2004, something like that, and it was sort of sloppy. 
Uh, the focus was hit or miss, and the controls via the camera body were iffy. And, and the reason I, I bring that up is because you can look at the 24-70 to 70 now, and it is a gorgeous lens. I would put it on par with the Canon's original 24-70 to 70 as far as, as glass is concerned for your Canon body. But uh, Samyung is moving into the market for the first time, and I would be concerned about uh, the very first offering of AF from a company that A, has never done autofocus on any of their lenses previously, and B, is reverse engineering a design to work with a camera body such as the Sony A7 line of cameras. Uh, those are two red flags for me that yeah. say, like, how well are we acting? Actually, the get AF out of, you know, autofocus controls out of this guy. And then you go back and you look at some of Sony's own glass and its performance with their two bodies. And there's been numerous issues there where the AF was not as fast or as quick with some lenses as it could have been. And that's the company that makes the camera body. <laughs> so uh, I don't know, Mitch, what do you think? You think uh, yes or no? Buy look out for keep an eye on should i review a couple of them what do you think uh if if uh sam yang is watching and they want to send us uh, a couple of copies to test out we'll certainly be very interested in that opportunity am i going to go drop some money on it not well we haven't even seen the specs yet so we don't know but i i think you're right. The obvious answer is wait and see. Let's find out what they're announcing in detail. And then I would wait to see whether or not it really performs. I'm really uh, willing to place a wager that we're going to see at least one or two of these two lenses <laughs> in their announcement. Uh, I, I, maybe I'm completely wrong, but I don't think so. It seems as though they sort of like, they didn't mean to announce it. It just sort of came out, and then it's kind of sat on the back shelf for many months. Right. Uh, and then this is the official announcement. And five lenses in five weeks. I mean, you really had to have been doing some planning ahead of time yep. to, to do that. So uh, previously leaked lenses, I would say very likely that's the case. And I, I would say almost 100% we're going to see at least one AF FE lens for the A7 line of cameras in that collection. So yeah. interesting. I'm going to keep an eye out for it. You'll hear more about it on the show. There's links to both uh, the articles that uh, we reference here, uh, both the uh, coming soon as well as that autofocus in Sam Young lenses. So check both of those out. Mitch, you have anything to add before we get out of here? Uh, no. Have a great week. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, guys, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And make sure to leave your comments, questions, and concerns. Uh, we have been trying to address delay and audio issues. So if you are a pro at Google Hangouts and you know something <laughs> that I do not know, feel free to school me with your a plethora of information. Mitch, where can people find you? I'm at a website called Planet 5D, and I'd play a sound effect if my sound effects were working, but I don't. So anyway, you can find me at planetmitch.com, too, if you want to go look at some of the other stuff I'm working on. Uh, and, you know, Twitter, Facebook. And thanks for watching. Thanks for rating us. Uh, give us a big happy face on iTunes if you want. Tell your friends about us. Yes. I'm at, at DSLR Film Noob on Twitter. You can find me on SoundCloud, iTunes, at DSLR Film Noob, and anywhere podcasts are distributed. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time on another well done episode of DSLR <laughs> Film Noob Podcast. <laughs>
I plan to, uh, guys, if you're still watching right now, um, you should be seeing some more test videos as well as some demos with this little Yi camera uh, coming out shortly, as well as a full review of that uh, audio that I was talking about in the previous show, and now for some reason it's escaping me. What the, I think it's the mix mic. The mix mic is what yeah, it's called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'll be hearing more about the mix mic probably by the end of the weekend. That that is a great device, by the way. Uh, they've really knocked it out of the park with that, and it's half the price of an audio adapter for your Sony A7S body. Good job there with that guy. I like it yeah. a lot. Ceremonic. Good. Great job. Good. Sam Young. These yeah, the, uh, uh, after show oh, prices are pretty cheap. Yeah, have you looked at any of their semi, uh, their no. cinema lenses? No. So lately, they've been the reason uh, Sam Young has been doing well is their brand Rokinon, which is just uh, another branding of several of their flavors of lenses, uh, come out with cinema gears and declipped a- apertures. So right. you can basically strap them under a rig and use them similarly to what you could with a Canon Cinema Prime. And right. a lot of them, uh, a lot of people argue that they are very good as well as good enough for most people to have as their set of Cinema Primes for yeah. shooting. Yeah, I noticed that they have like the 35 millimeter T15, so yeah. they're even doing T-stops, which is awesome. Yeah, they're really, you know, I've shot, I've shot some stuff on their uh, 51.4, or excuse me, 50 T15, uh, 50, uh, 35, and uh, they're 85, and they were nice. I, it was good to work with. Uh, my focus puller really liked it a lot. Uh, the images looked good. I didn't have any problem with them at all. Uh, I can't afford Cinema Primes from Canon, <laughs> and most people can't. Uh, those will set you back quite a bit more. Uh, so uh, these are a definite alternative. Have you seen the, the other one? And it was a Kickstarter launched set of Cinema Primes. Uh, the they started with the V. It was like the Veron, Viron, Vion, something Veron? like that. No, uh, uh, no, no, it's not Veron. No. Uh, but they were a micro four third set of I think F two point two primes, and I, I haven't I hadn't seen any in the wild until just recently. I was wandering down to meet a friend, and he was on a shoot, and they had a couple of them there, and. Uh, he got those on the Kickstarter at an extraordinary price, and now apparently they've. I think the price has doubled on those. So, uh, an actual success in a Kickstarter campaign. I know we talked. I think we even talked about the, the that particular lens on the show. It's it's escaping me for some reason. Yeah. Uh, um. I wish I had it in front of me. Uh, another exciting Kickstarter. No, 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 no. Uh, speaking of lenses, and it, and I watched. It might be, and if I if I'd finish a sentence, people would probably appreciate me a lot more if I could just get something out. So I saw a video a couple of weeks ago uh, from Shane Hurlbut, my good friend Shane Hurlbut, comparing Zeiss to Canon to. Leica to something else, I've forgotten. Ex- expensive cinema lenses. Uh, and it might be only available to his um, monthly subscribers because he's got that, uh, uh, you know, like name. a paywall? Yeah, he's got a, a really good, the inner circle. He's got a, the inner circle. He's got he's producing some fabulous content. It's only twenty bucks a month. So, and this is this is a plug if you haven't seen it. But um, fascinating stuff. But and I'll I'll try to see if I can find this video. It it again. It might be for inner circle members only. But it was fascinating to see somebody at his level. You know, somebody that's that's paid a lot of money to make the big Hollywood movies take the same scene with multiple lenses from multiple vendors and explain why this one was a little bit higher contrast or this one's a little bit blue. I mean, I remember talking to him one day and he says, oh, Leica's Leica's always a more blue, blah, blah, blah. And he had Zeiss too. But when you you get to that level, to be able to – because one of the things that's always frustrated me, and, and you probably have learned a lot along the way, 
but you know, to hear somebody say, well, I prefer Canon lenses over Leica because Canon's given me, you know, a better look. And you're like, okay, you take two lenses and, and if they're not looking at the same scene, how do you tell any difference? You know, it takes a lot of learning yeah. to, to understand all of these differences and over the years and to have Shane sit down and do that video was fascinating to watch because, you know, just really lays out the differences. And I still would sit down and go, okay, in the long run for me, it probably doesn't matter, but it's fascinating to hear him explain why these lenses would be used for certain scenes or certain looks and feels. And anyways, I, you were just talking, we were just talking about the differences in lenses and that video popped into my head. And oh, you're I, absolutely I really right. I it. mean, there's a lot of, my can I always say like oh I like the look of my Canon glass and I say right. it like arbitrarily like everybody knows what I'm talking about but maybe you don't necessarily know that the the coatings that they use on certain Canon lenses are superior to some of the coatings that are used on the glass in other lenses and the way that the light interacts with those coatings causes different color changes in the items you're shooting contrast at various other effects that give the unique look of that particular lens. And I mean, I've seen it with my M43 glass, uh, micro four thirds stuff. Some lenses are just like, they're beautiful. Now, like you look, you shoot something, you're like, this is great. And then you switch over to a Panasonic lens that's comparable and like, it, you can't put your finger on it, but it's just a little bit not right, not as beautiful. And right. you, you, you beat your head trying to figure out what you're doing wrong. You check your lighting and a few things and then oh, well, wait a minute, you know, this one has the micro whatever coating that they put on the lens that just makes it a little bit better. And I didn't think that would be that much of a problem until I started, uh, you know, with Micro Four Thirds, you have multiple lens manufacturers. So right. you can actually go get Olympus versus Panasonic uh, versus various other manual focus lenses and, and start looking at the same focal length, 25 millimeters, which is the 50 millimeter equivalent and seeing the difference. And there is a difference, you know, some lenses will provide a little bit warmer image. Some of the lenses, uh, you know, they sort of they sort of uh, have a little bit of fall off in that uh, brighter yellow color that gives you sort of a blue crisp feel. And you got to remember that when you start going out to shoot because, you know, if you're shooting something happy uh, and someone telling a really good story about their bakery or something like that and you <laughs> you make it feel cold and sterile like a hospital, uh, it's, uh, it's very yeah. unfortunate. And, I mean, right. it's less forgiving when you don't shoot in a raw mode where you can sort of warm it up in post. There's not a lot of flexibility uh, I mean, there's a little bit of flexibility, but if you're not shooting flat, you know, there's not a ton of flexibility to moving your image around. So right. be cautious of that. Right. Uh, the lens I was trying to think of is Vidra. Oh, yeah. Right, right. right. Vidra was the set. So if anybody was like screaming the trivia in the back of their head right there, Vidra is the lens set that I was trying to remember. Uh, what do you, before we go, Mitch, and we always do this, we end up rambling for a little bit after the show. Ah. So you got the car thing. If that goes well and it, you, you, know, you don't end up shelling out any more money, you were talking about buying more lenses. Is this going to eat into your, your next lens buy? or? It, well, right now it's going to eat into my college fund for my kids is what it's oh. going to eat into. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, uh, let's but, no more depressing talk. <laughs> well, the key, the key though is I'll t I'll tell you. Something has changed my life recently, and and I know you're in business, right? You have have your own production that that you charge people for. Little tip, and and I could go into a whole lot of detail if somebody wants to, but uh, Planet Five D is a business, and I have run it poorly for a long time. And I have recently hired an accountant, and my accountant, uh, which I never, I usually, I did all my accounting on a spreadsheet for a <laughs> long time, and it was, it was horrible, especially at tax time. Uh, but I've hired an accountant, which is my first advice. Uh, you can get them fairly inexpensively if you want. Uh, but one of the things she taught me is there's a, there's a, a philosophy called uh, profit first. And it really makes a hell of a lot of sense when you start thinking about it. And I won't go into a whole – there's a book. Uh, you can go out and look for it. It's called Profit First, and I've forgotten the guy's name that wrote it. Uh, but the idea, just like you should be doing for your own personal finances, you should have 
you should not be living month to month or, or week to week or paycheck to paycheck, right? You should have some savings set aside for emergencies. And a lot of people don't. Uh, and the same thing is true for your business. And by using this profit first methodology, I'm actually turning a profit for the first time. I mean, I, you know, we've always paid our bills and we, you know, we've done other, but I've always lived sort of in stress of, am I going to have enough money at the end of the year to pay my taxes? Um, you know, my estimated taxes, I never paid those in advance. Uh, you know, all kinds of things. So if you're in business, just like if you're, if you have a personal situation, and suddenly, you know, your car crashes or a tree falls on your car and, and insurance isn't going to pay for some of that stuff. For example, the insurance agent said, well, we'll pay for the damage to the car, but we won't pay for somebody to cut the tree up and haul it away. Well, that was 600 bucks. Dang. <laughs> so, you know, those kind of things, you need to be prepared. You need to have some money set aside. And... Figure out some way of doing that. Pay yourself 10% out of your paycheck, out of out, when you when you do a job, don't just go, oh, let's have a big beer party or whatever. <laughs> Take some of that money and put it aside and create a rainy day fund that needs to have at least three months worth of, of your income in it. Uh, if you're in a business, look at Profit First or some methodology where you're saving some of your money and not just spending every penny that comes in because I, we all know you got a bank account and if it's got a thousand dollars in it oh man i'll find a way to spend a thousand dollars i'll buy a lens <laughs> I'll, I'll buy you know and then at the end of the year you're going how am i going to pay my taxes how am i going to pay for some of my expenses that i forgot that were going to come up and you stress out and that, and that sucks i hated it and i don't have that stress anymore so that's all my long-winded positive rant for the end of the show no that's great man that's exactly that's exactly what i have been doing my entire life i actually every check that i get i allocate x number percent to a separate account that is my i, I always call it the os account but uh you know, what people, does os stand for uh oh shit. oh that one okay <laughs> You know, when something really bad happens, but some people say rainy day fund or what have you. Right. And uh, you let that build up and you stay away from it. You don't touch it and you f you use the rest. And so you just sort of pretend like you got paid a little bit less for the work you're doing and you leave that alone. And then, you know. And you realize you can live on that. Oh, exactly. And, yeah. uh, you know, you talk to talk to a lot of people and I have friends in the industry that uh, contract quite a bit and they don't have proper insurance. You know, they don't have proper health insurance. They don't have proper uh, coverage. Can't afford it. And I go over to their house and they just got done, you know, getting paid for a job and they've got, you know, gourmet beer in the refrigerator and they've bought steaks to throw a grill and they've, they've picked up some, you know, a new camera bags and like a new laptop. And it's like, uh, Hello. You do. You, you just need to figure out like what what are these items that you have and which ones are the most important to you and which ones aren't. Like, can you live on a little bit cheaper beer? Do you really need the, the fanciest steaks every weekend? Do you need to eat out all the time? No. Any of those things that you can uh, call back uh, can give you uh, enough room, enough breathing room to make your life a lot more comfortable when lightning inevitably strikes a tree and causes it to fall down onto a car or you know your house or any of the other things that could go wrong with you or you get really sick i don't ever want to see someone in a spot where like uh, hospital bills uh, completely bowl you know roll them over and yeah. unfortunately i have i've i've had friends that have ended up with cancer and had no plan no insurance and they're done you know i mean they're, yeah. they're why if like luckily you know they can't be refused care but you know financially they lose their house lose everything they're they're basically yep. you know apartment dweller if they can even get an apartment from then right. on it's it's rough so yeah. don't don't do that to yourself guys yeah amen we Our, should probably do a whole show on that i know right uh counting is it's so it's lame, but it's, it's so lame. important to Absolutely. living. And yeah. I've talked about it before. You know, people buy equipment all the time, and they don't amortize their freaking lenses. You know, they don't charge them out to jobs. And so you have 
except that I, I do actually charge my stuff out. So, and so then I can account for it. I can be like, oh yeah, you know, this lens is paid for right here. This lens is almost paid for. This lens has been paid for for a long time and makes me money every time I use it. <laughs> and you explain something like that and people's eyes get wide. They're like, why well, just yeah. buy, buy this? Cause I, I want that lens. Like exactly. your camera is a tool to do your job. <laughs> Right. Amen, Burrow. Amen. That's the end for the video, listeners. Uh, before I start raising my skinny fist to the sky like small antennas, I need to <laughs> get out of here. So, Mitch, have All a right. great week, and we'll see you on the next show. Take care, okay. man. Bye.